Hi, I'm Stephen Goldblum from Morgan Stanley. I'm here with Adam Hurwitz from Microsoft. We're here to talk about greatly increasing development efficiency with a combination of two powerful open source projects. Morpher, which is a FinOS project, recently contributed by Morgan Stanley, and Dapper, which is a Microsoft open source project. So application development. This is really where the, um, the developer provides real value. And what is it they do? They take complex business concepts and they turn them into complex computer concepts. Uh, that's really the, the, the bulk of what the value is that a developer does in an application development environment. Uh, of course, and then we need to make it run. So that's the most important thing is that it needs to run. And so that's what we think of as the core developer value in the process of developing applications. Then we hit the enterprise and we find out that that's just a small fraction of what we need to do in terms of coding. All of a sudden we go to the enterprise and we find out that there's probably some um, standard frameworks that we need to support. We've got regulations, we've got blueprints, standards. Um, we need to register data here. We need to register lineage. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that we need to do. And it actually takes up probably the majority of the development time. So what we consider as developer value is not what most developers spend most of their time on. Um, and that also has consequences in terms of, well, it's not that efficient anymore. And it's risky because some studies show that for every thousand lines of computer code that a developer writes, there's 10 bugs. And so with all that code that we're writing on top of the, the business code, um, we're just adding more bugs. And so that's, that's a risk issue. And so naturally you might think, well, what if? What if we could go back to just concentrating on what's important, back to turning the, the, computer, the business concepts into computer concepts, and we could do something else with all these other things. We can't make them disappear because they're important. They need to be done. Um, there's a couple ways that you can deal with it. You can try to put it all behind frameworks. That puts a lot of, of pressure on frameworks. Or maybe, and this is what we try to do, you can automate a lot of that. Um, and that's where Morpher comes in. So at its core, Morpher is a, a set of tools aimed at logic interchange. And what that means is that we can define a set of logic, put it into a data format, in this case, it's the Morpher Intermediary Language, or IR. And once it's in a data format, then we can do all kinds of things with it, just like any other data. So we can use that, that data format to generate other code that runs in different runtime contexts, or generate configuration and setup to the database and all these other kind of definitions that we might need. Um, we don't have to stop there. We can generate full applications. So. We don't have to just concentrate on the code, we can get into everything else that makes an application. And that's what we were really talking about in the enterprise. Uh, and on top of that, we can do things like generate documentation, generate lineage, generate, you know, all these other things that the enterprise asks us to do. Morpher Project has a number of goals. The primary goal is to make business logic a first class asset, something that's protected and stored separately from the rest of the application. Once it's in that format, then we can do things like share it, which is important if we want it to run in different contexts. Or maybe we want the same logic to run across different teams or maybe even different firms when we're talking about something like regulations. We want to be able to translate it because we want it to run in different environments. And in order to do that, we need to translate it into different languages, maybe um, different platforms, uh, documentation. So we want to be able to take that logic and translate it into other tools. We want to be able to store it because it is an asset, right? We don't want the um, we don't want to have to risk rewriting it every time we want to change technologies. And we all know that business evolves different than the technologies, and they should be able to evolve independently. And we want to be able to visualize it. We want to give as much knowledge as possible. We want new developers to be able to really understand the system uh, without piecing through and, and diving into all kinds of uh, hard to read code because it's mixed in with all all the persistence and messaging and all these other things that go into an application. And some other goals that we have are that we want to increase efficiency with automation. Uh, and that's 
that's a primary thing of what Morpher does is that once you've got it in the stored format, you can automate a whole lot of things, not just code, but documentation, regulations, audit, all kinds of stuff. We want to make sure it's correct. So this is vital. It's difficult to make sure that an application is correct when it is doing the right thing when the logic is all over the place or when the logic is mixed in with things like persistence and messaging and loading. And so by consolidating on a model, we're able to make it more correct. And by consolidating on a functional model, we're even able to do more than, than just look at it and see that it's correct. We're able to apply powerful tools to ensure that the model is more correct than we would usually be able to do with other programming languages. Um, it's important to note that bugs are a symptom. They're a symptom of the code being wrong. And testing and unit testing are great ways to handle that symptom. It still means that we want to be able to take care of the cause and the cause is we need to get the code right and so we want to be able to provide tools that enable us to do that we want to build knowledge as i said before we want new developers to be able to understand the system we also want the business users to understand the system and have confidence in the system and understand that what we have developed is actually what they wanted to do and there are a lot of things that we can do in terms of automating tools that allow the business users to have that confidence, either in terms of, of you know, showing data flow through the system and why it's making decisions. So not just that the data is going through the system and is making decisions, but you know, why did it make that decision? And those are, are, are important things for both the business and the technology. Finally, we want a community. We want to build a community. We've realized that um, once people start to, to use Morpher and understand it, then they get a lot of creative solutions. And the sum of those solutions always come back and everybody can take advantage of them. And it just builds a, a much stronger and stronger ecosystem. And that was part of the motivation of open sourcing it was that we felt that we could build a really, really strong ecosystem around us. All right, so what is the flow of developing a Morpher application? So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get your business logic sound in, in, into the Morpher format. So the first thing you do is work with the business closely and come up with what the business model design is. So we're gonna design the model. Once we have that model, then we're gonna to wanna to generate something. So we probably wanna generate documentation we probably want to generate some kind of registration into whatever systems our enterprise use. And most importantly, we want to generate onto the platform that this thing's going to run on, or maybe multiple platforms, but we want to generate that. So imagine that it's running in a, in a microservice uh, environment. We want to be able to generate the code that actually runs that microservice. And then once we have that code, obviously we need to run it. And so that's basically the more for flow. Design the, the business logic, generate the application, run the application. And so what does that look at, like in the bigger scheme of software development? So probably right now you have something like the, uh, the, the top flow where you work with the business to come up with the business specifications, you architect a solution for that particular problem, then you code up the, the business logic into that particular solution that you've architected and then you've got the regular build, test, and deploy cycle. So the first three steps here are very manual in the current flow. What we want to do is move that so that the, we minimize as much manual effort as possible, and we can do that by getting the business specs together, and that's the only manual process. And if you think about it, that should be the only manual process. And then everything else after that, we can automate. So let's dig in and take a look at what that actually looks like. We're going to take a sample common application. So uh, think about a microservice or any kind of service that takes a request and does something with it. So in this case, we're going to have a, a, a small microservice sample called books and records that takes a request to book a deal and um, run some logic to see whether we should book that deal, and if so, it books it, and if not, it, it rejects it for some reason. So standard microservice architecture application. So the thing we realize with a microservice is that 
you know, this is actually a business process and it's a business process that follows a very standard pattern of it takes some input, it runs some logic, and then it produces some results. And whenever we have a pattern like that, that's a good case for automation. And so let's look at that. So in this case, the request, the input is that we either create a deal, um, in which case we're trying to book it into our booking system, or we close the deal, in which case we're trying to remove it from our booking system in one way or the other. And so how we would model that. So Morpher, as I said before, is using an open source programming language called Elm. And in Elm, that looks like this. And it really reads as um, you're defining a union type where either of these could be a command. You can have a command that either says open the deal with all the parameters that are required or close the deal. So similarly, we want to see the results, right? And so the specifications say that a client would want to see the results. Maybe there's somebody else that wants to see the results. So maybe we should, we should do something with that as well. But in the end, you know, the pattern is that we need to see a result. And what that looks like in Morpher is, again, another union type of here's the possible things that, that the outcomes that we could have for the inputs that we have. So we can either open the deal and say that, yeah, it was successfully opened or closed, or something was wrong and it, the request was invalid, in which case we wanna let them know that as well. Most microservices have some kind of state in between calls, um, so this is common. It's still a business model, you know, business model says that we wanna keep some state, uh, and in this case, the state is a bunch of deals or a list of deals. And so uh, in the deal, these are the, the parameters that we want to store. This, again, we would work out with the business. This is how we would model it in Elm. And in this case, this is a record type, which is you know, a standard data structure. And then finally, uh, and not, not the, the least, is the, the logic. So when we get a request, you know, what do we need to do with it? In our case, we want to check that the price and the quantity are valid. Um, so there's no specification on there uh, that, that says that you know, these, are, these are, they can only be less than zero or, or greater than zero. And so um, that's what our business logic is doing. So we kept it very simple for the example. Obviously, most applications have much more complex business logic, um, but that's it. And so it's a standard pattern. It's a request, response, state, and then the logic for processing it. All right, so let's take a look at this code in an IDE. So one of the things I want to point out is that with, with Morpher, we're really focused on domain-driven development or domain-driven design. And one of the principles of that is that we use the business language when we make our technology. So we want to use terms like price and quantity, especially when we're talking with the business. We would never say things like float or rent to the business. And so we want to capture that in our model, and we do this with the Elm type aliases. Uh, so that's very important. And, um, you know, we see all the rest here, the, the commands and the inputs and the outputs in the state and in the business logic. And that's it. That's the entire application. So you'll notice nothing in here says that this is restful or using a message queue, or if it's, um, event sourced or using regular OLTP and database transactions or, or any of that stuff. None of that is in there. And what that does is it makes it very easy to understand the code. So we can see that this service is, is really, you know, here's the inputs and outputs. It's very easy to understand. And it's often very difficult to do when you look at enterprise software because the code is scattered throughout different parts of the system. And it's, you know, some of the codes in the database and some of the codes in UI code and some of the codes in the service. Uh, and so if we can model it like this, as the system gets bigger and more complex, it's really nice to be able to look at the thing holistically and really understand what's going on without being distracted with, oh, it's got to save something here or it's, you know, loading stuff from the database there or any of that stuff that makes it difficult to understand. And so that's a really important concept. 
And so what we're going to do here is we're going to take this model and we're going to basically turn it into the Morpher IR. Again, we're using Elm in this case to do the modeling. And so what we're doing is we're parsing Elm into the Morpher IR. And um, just as a, a reminder, the, Elm is not the only language we can do this with. And so this is often interesting in terms of enterprises because often an enterprise has a lot of little bespoke DSLs, domain, domain um, languages, and um, you know, little expression languages that pepper throughout the entire uh, enterprise. And they've kind of end of life. Nobody's really keeping them up, but they're still making the application run. And so nobody really knows what to do with that. And so Morpher is, a, is an interesting way of dealing with that. And if you can parse those languages into the Morpher IR, then you can take advantage of the Morpher tools, which means that you can transpile them into Scala, into Elm, into some other language. And that gives a lifeline to those languages. They're no longer stuck in a, in a bespoke DSL. Um, and so the next thing we're gonna do is once we've got that IR, we still want to make this thing run. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, this time we want the, this to run in Dapper. So our output target is a, a Dapper application. And so we'll see that it's, it's generating all this code. Uh, it generated it over here. And one of the things we notice here is that it's generating the Maven as well. So it's not just generating code, it's generating the entire application. Um, and so we can look at the code and we can see that everything that was in the model is now in case classes in Scala. So that it's, it's all there. The logic is here. So the, you know, the logic gets translated to, and then all the dapper stuff is, is in there as well. So all the things that we would normally write by hand, we are now generating. And that is advantageous because it saves time and it saves bugs. As we mentioned before, uh, the less, human code is written, the, the, the less bugs will be produced. So it, it saves us from possible bugs. Um, and it also makes things, uh, um, you know, kind of future proof and evolution proof. So if we wanted to do something like change the uh, messaging format from Jackson and JSON to gRPC, we could do that and we wouldn't have to go back to the developers and tell them to do that. Or if we wanted to make this run, you know, Dapper is a, is a great runtime, but a lot of this logic might need to run somewhere else, like in the database if we're running reports. And if we want to be able to, to, you know, like replay something and see why it came to a conclusion, you know, why did it reject this thing? Well, you know, we can do things like make that run in the, in the browser and, and make that run in, in a different system at a different time using different technologies. Um, and know that we get consistent results. And, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously important too. And, you know, we can also think about other ways we can use this. So, you know, let's take something like contract-driven development where um, a contract-driven development is basically a way to do REST, REST API testing where the, the server doesn't have to be running. You should be able to have some confidence that the client code you're writing is going to get the, some certain results from the server without making the server be running. And the way to do that is that you have these mock clients or, or mock servers um, that the clients call. Well, imagine that if we could take the entire set of business logic that's in the server that the server's running and make that run on that mock or in the browser. So then we could type in things and test our clients and immediately know the full range of results that we're going to get, which is a lot more meaningful than just a couple test cases that, that contract driven development does now. So there's a whole lot of things that we can do with this. And so in summary, what have we done? We've taken a pattern that's common in the business world, inputs, outputs, some state. Um, we've, Converted that into computer concepts, high-level computer concepts, not, you know, how are these things going to run, but computer concepts. And then we've automated turning that into a running application. Uh, and that application is, is on Dapper. So we've automated the code 
the, the JSON bindings, the persistence, the event mechanism, and most importantly, the dapper code. And with that, I'm gonna pass this to Adam, and he's gonna explain dapper and its advantages and how it works. Hey, Adam Hurwitz here with Microsoft. I'm an Azure specialist in the financial services organization. And you just heard from Stephen Goldbaum uh, from Morgan Stanley about the, the Morpher project. And the first thing I want to do is I just want to commend Morgan Stanley absolutely in terms of open sourcing this project and taking their years of experience and IP and sharing it with the community. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit that other companies are going to get from this. And, you know, we're definitely excited to see how this project uh, develops uh, as an open source project. Um, what I'm here to talk about is Dapper. Uh, you would have heard about that uh, just now with, uh, from Stephen, um, that Morpher, the Morpher project can work well in combination with Dapper, and Dapper is a Microsoft open source project. And so, you know, this is what we want to explore right now. Go a little deeper, make sure you understand uh, how this, what this tool is, and, and the basics of how it works. Um, so let me just switch over here. So Dapper, it's, uh, you know, it's a cute name. Open source projects all have to have cute names now, D-A-P-R. Um, and it's a distributed application runtime. It's available, you know, you should go check it out, uh, dapper.io. Uh, it's a open source project. Uh, it's in GitHub. So this will click through to various repos that we have in GitHub. Um, and, you know, a, a distributed application runtime, it, the focus here is, you know, you're, you're a developer and you are uh, creating services that are part of um, a distributed application. And, you know, so many applications now are distributed. Certainly all the significant applications being built now, the kind of complexity they have, the number of people they have, have the, you know, a microservice architecture um, um, distributed out, uh, you know, such that multiple teams are working on this. So Dapper provides building blocks uh, for you to use as a developer to build your application and do it in, a, in an easier fashion without having to worry about um, how those building blocks are implemented exactly um, and how, those, how, how they're provided to you. And I'll, I'll get into more detail what I mean by that. Um, first, I wanna just uh, say some of the high level goals here, okay? So we have a developer who wants to build a, 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 a distributed application, a, a team. So the, they're gonna to decide to use Dapper. They wanna have best practice building blocks around building the application. They wanna use any language or framework. This is an interesting point I just wanna to touch on because you know certainly in large uh, systems, there's multiple teams, lots of teams. Maybe there's some legacy code as well for certain functionality uh, perhaps. And, you know, they're using different languages, they're using different tech stacks. And so it's very important that that is supported for a distributed application. Um, as I just talked about, it's open source. We want the community to be involved uh, and, and, and have it use standards and be open in terms of the API and consistent. Um, agnostic to cloud platform is important and edge. Um, you know, this should not be tied to um, a one cloud platform. It should be something that you can run on premise cloud, uh, um, really anywhere, uh, for it to really be usable in terms of your distributed application, because that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people um, who want to make sure that they have, uh, you know, their application running in multiple places often. Um, and then, of course, extensible and pluggable. It's now, you know, um, pluggable gets into for uh, in a second. It'll be a little more clear what we mean by that these building blocks, these services that you're using in your application for it to work. There should be different ways to plug in different um, implementations, essentially. Um, and extensible, you know, instead of um, others, um, other companies, other, other developers wanting to um, work on the core functionality, they should be able to add in other components and extend these, these, the implementation of, uh, of the system, uh, really. So let's start at the bottom here. These building blocks I'm talking about. What are, you know, l l let's talk about some of them. Um, you know, at a high level, um, I think they're relatively straightforward if you've been working on any distributed um, applications. Of course, you know, let's just start at the simple one. I won't go through all of these, but the, you know, service to service invocation, obvious, you know, initial uh, problem to, uh, to deal with and solve. Um, you have multiple microservices. 
uh, that are operating as part of your system. Um, how do they talk to each other? How do they call each other? Um, so that service to service uh, invoking a function on a different service is something that Dapper can provide. That's one of these building blocks, which is incredibly useful. Uh, state management, of course, um, another you know, foundational uh, need uh, for your application. Uh, you need to save state um, and et cetera. You can see across these different building blocks um, that um, you know, we feel are generally the ones um, that, you know, that you need when you're building your application. Now we're gonna be adding to these. You can pick and choose which ones make sense to you. You know, one here, for instance, actors, um, you know, is that a programming model that you use? You know, if so, then this is great. Some people do, uh, many people don't. So that's just not, you know, a building block that you make use of. Now, what's really important here to point out uh, and notice um, is the API. So I talked about, let's do standards, let's do open, let's do portable, let's do consistent. Well, look, you know, you have, look at how the APIs are talking. It's HTTP, it's gRPC, you know, Anybody, uh, any system, any application code, uh, tech stack can speak HTTP at this point, uh, certainly. And, you know, they have gRPC implementations of, uh, uh, certainly as well. But HTTP, um, by and large, um, uh, you know, allows us to, to say across the board any code uh, or framework uh, that you want to use, that you want to bring. Um, so that is how your code calls into Dapper into the Dapper system, into these building blocks, um, is through that that API. And just to give you a little flavor here, you know, this are are some standard calls that you're going to make. I'll, I'll get a little deeper into this now. Um, you know, the architecture in general uh, is a sidecar architecture. This is becoming more popular. Um, it's certainly something more people have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking about, talking about in the last, uh, I don't know, a few years or, or so. Um, and so you can see here, um, now in this, you know, uh, uh, description of um, a system that uses Dapper, that's built with Dapper, you know, you have two applications, two services, two microservices, service code A, service code B that make up your application. And then of course there's a sidecar with each, which is Dapper, right? So there's a Dapper daemon running um, that associated with each one and the service code interacts with that sidecar and that's how they interact with the rest of the of the dapper system they, that might be calling each other right um, and that's secure communication with mtls um, or you know as i pointed out before state store pub sub now you'll see with the state store for instance you'll see a number of technologies there that are outlined as implementations of the state store that are used as the service that is that is being used as a state store. So um, for the service code, the application that you're writing, you know that you need a state store. You know you need to store something in state, retrieve it. But for but as a, as a developer, you know you don't you don't it doesn't you don't care what store maybe is being used. It's not necessarily something that you're thinking about. You need to put it in. You need to get it out and make use of it. Um, and so for the, the administrator, for the operator of the system, um, they're gonna determine what is the best state store and they're gonna plug it in. They're gonna configure Dapper, Dapper to make use of that storage service. Uh, in this case, certainly, you know, Redis, uh, uh, Azure Cosmos DB, Cassandra. And this is where some of the extensibility comes in because there are some that are, uh, uh, that are there that are where there are, you know, connectors into these storage services. But of course, um, this is an open source project and there are those who are, you know, they wanna use a certain storage service here and they're writing that connector and that, that, that component to make sure that they can use it as a state store. Um, and we're seeing quite a bit of that at this point, which is great. Um, PubSub, same thing, um, you know, as you can see listed here. And so this is another level of detail of how the system works. Let me go you know, a touch deeper now into hosting. So right now you're saying, well, what can you run this? How do you run this? So you can run it locally. Um, what happens is you're gonna get a Dapper CLI, you're gonna uh, install and run. Uh, you can run locally, mainly for development. Um, and then the primary target at this point um, is Kubernetes. 
Uh, Kubernetes certainly has become, you know, the way in which um, enterprises, uh, certainly lots of uh, companies, lots of uh, uh, startups as well, are choosing um, to abstract uh, infrastructure and manage infrastructure essentially um, and manage their containers running on top of that uh, infrastructure. And so um, that is our target uh, primarily for, for hosting. And so what happens is you install some pods, Dapper pods into Kubernetes. Um, and those are the, you know, the, the, the guts of the system, if you will. Um, and they do a variety of things, including sidecar injector. Uh, there's an operator there. Uh, there's a pod that, that manages the security. Um, and so in Kubernetes, as you can see, uh, and if you know, I mean, it has that interesting concept of the pod, uh, which can be one or more containers. Uh, which is an interesting um, um, aspect of the of the service and uh, of the system. And so, when you deploy your your application into a Dapper enabled a Dapper aware uh, cluster, and you say that this is using Dapper, the sidecar injector will put the Dapper container, the sidecar container, into your pod, and then your container can talk to it and it can interact through the configuration that you have done on the cluster with the other services, the other, ser uh, the other services, the other um, um, uh, building blocks, uh, you know, for instance, if we've been talking about pub, sub, state store, certainly distributed tracing. Um, one thing that's interesting about the system I'll just mention is observability. Um, you know, every everything is running through Dapper, then certainly um, that gives you a very interesting way to observe what's happening uh, in the system. And so it connects with known uh, logging, um, you know, open telemetry, Prometheus, Grafana, Azure Monitor uh, for you to um, understand what's happening in your system, which is a real, real, real big benefit um, as well. And certainly Kubernetes, it's, it's Kubernetes, whatever cloud, on-prem, et cetera. And so um, that is uh, very... Uh, very useful for people. Let me show just a little bit of code before I close out here. Um, just so you get a flavor of, again, a, another level lower in terms of what I'm talking about. So what I have here quickly is a YAML file to deploy. So just so you know, so you have your container with your application, um, you deploy it into Kubernetes. You can see here, I mean, it's books and records, which is one of the examples uh, that's part of Morpher. Um, and, you know, this is just a real vanilla, simple uh, example. You can see it's just a, you know, there's a service, there's a deployment, and you can see here there's an annotation, right? So the annotation here lets the system know this is Dapper enabled, right? Uh, the name of your service support to call it on. And there it is, it's book, we're gonna call it books and record. Um, and it's, it's part of Dapper, so that sidecar is gonna get uh, injected. And then, you know, otherwise, uh, again, it's it's just your container. This one happens to be in the Azure Container Registry, um, you know, deploying uh, to Kubernetes. Your app, very simple example, um, could look like this. Uh, this is just a Flask Python, you know, few liner um, where there's an add function, right? There's an add, uh, there's a route for add, which is post. It's not returning anything. It's only returning a string right now but that could be your service. And um, the, the, another service wanting to call it, you know, the call would just look like this. So what this call would be from, let's say service B um, or some client perhaps of the books and record uh, application service would be, you know, local host, right? So it's gonna be hitting its own Dapper sidecar on a port. It's going to be invoking, this is service invocation. And then books and records is the ID that we had in the YAML for that container. And then the method it's going to call is add. And it's, this it happens to be a post uh, dash X. Uh, this was part of like a, you know, a curl command um, to call that service. So that's how it's going to look um, for get state. Uh, let's start with save state. So with save state, you have your key value pairs. Uh, formatted in this situation, and you're just making a request of your Dapper sidecar, HTTP, on the port 
and this one is a state request. And then to get that out, just, you know, you, you're now doing a get. And for that key that you defined of where your, your, your state is being stored under as in the state store, and then you get it back. The last thing I just want to show here uh, quickly um, is in Warfer. This is integrated. Um, Stephen, we've talked about this a bit. Um, but, you know, there's a stateful app that is defined, for instance. And you can see in this Elm code that Morpher uses, you know, it just says it's a stateful app. So that any interaction with state, you know, what is so interesting that they have done that uh, the Morpher team, Steven and Attila and so on have, have done is that it, it is going to generate out that Dapper code for you. Um, so that when you, uh, you've modeled your application and then uh, um, uh, it will implement it in uh, whichever language you choose, Java, uh, .NET, et cetera, and we'll have the Dapper code there so that when you deploy it uh, into a cluster, um, you know, it will be able to interact uh, with the system, uh, however it's configured for whichever state store, pub sub, um, uh, et cetera. And um, that's what I wanted to just go over. Um, I hope you're excited about Dapper. Um, it's a um, we're very excited about it. It's, it's, it's being received well by the community. I think it has about 8,000 um, uh, uh, likes on, uh, on GitHub. And, uh, it have, sorry, stars on GitHub, plenty of forks, a lot of community involvement. There's regular community meetings that you can join. Um, I encourage you to check it out. And of course, uh, encourage you uh, to check out more for uh, part, of, part of FinOS right now and consider it for, uh, for your project. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Adam. And so there we have it, the combination of Dapper and Morpher. With Dapper, you get a powerful runtime. It does a lot of the heavy lifting that we would normally have to do, you know, with, with pulling in our own components, and it does the, the job of making this all work in an in a effective and efficient runtime. And then we have Morpher, uh, and, and Morpher enshrines the business knowledge into a data format so that it's protected from technology evolution. It makes it evolution ready and that we can take that same business logic and make it run in different technologies as technology evolves. It gives us the capabilities that are things that are outside of the runtime like documentation, uh, live documentation, maybe interactive documentation even so that you can audit you know, how did the system come to this conclusion at this particular time. So there's a lot of things you can do that are outside of a runtime that we can still do with automation once we have that business logic. Um, for example, we can use it to generate the full lineage so we can see that these inputs and these outputs in a calculation, um, you know, here's the results that we got and here's exactly why we got those results. So it's more than just watching the data flow, it's watching the data flow with the whole reason that we got it. Um, and finally, it makes the logic portable. So, you know, logic is often used throughout the system or even across projects and even across firms in the case of something like regulations. And so being able to define that logic in a common format that doesn't dictate a technology means that we can run it across projects, across technologies and across firms. So, with that, we have actually successfully done what we set out to do. Um, we've moved all that, that manual process into just one manual step and the rest is automated. Uh, what we didn't show you was that we've actually done it so that when you, we tied into the GitHub pipeline so that when a developer checks in the business model, the pure business model, it kicks off the entire process does the, the, the build, the testing, and then the deployment. So think of it as like one touch, write your pure business logic, check it in, do a merge, and it ends up in production in a running system. So what's next? Um, both of these projects are by developers and for developers. Uh, and so both would love the contribution of the development community. So uh, anybody who's interested, please go to morpher.finos.org for the, the Morpher project and dapper.io for the Dapper project. Thank you for listening.